What is this order one term? How to calculate it? It's uh, much harder. And for this, you need a uh, different uh, approach, different method. Because it contains, basically, this order one term contains what is called the regular part of the Green's function. So I haven't talked much about Green's function. I would say a word um, maybe now. But before that, um, I would like to explain what are the constraints of the domain for this to be correct. <coughs> for example, and again, this is important because this is really a way to coarse grain um, the partial differential equation to study chemical reaction. <coughs> So suppose you, so what we have in mind for this is a domain like this where we have here a small hole. Let's say of the size uh, epsilon can also be considered as a size. But what do you think? Are there domains where this formula is not valid or is not is insufficient? For example, here, we said last time, yesterday, if you start in this boundary layer, so this is the, the boundary layer is actually of size epsilon. And this is important because if you remember the two other tutorial, if you use the Smolochowski limit, f when you have a binding, when the molecule detaches from the domain, you have to position it at a certain distance away from the site. Otherwise, you'll have um, many returns due to Brownian motion. So this is due to this boundary layer here, where the probability to find, I mean, the, the mean time to find the domain when you start in this boundary layer is very different when you start here. Here, this is very large, log of 1 over epsilon, when epsilon goes to infinity. And this is uh, this can be of the order one or, or even smaller. So, who can think about a situation where this formula does not apply? Okay, let me help you. Suppose you have narrow passages in the domain. That is, instead of having this domain, you have a domain like this. And now comes some of the geometry. If you have a, a passage where the radius, basically, the radius of this passage, the width here, is of the same order of this. If you start here, or if you start here, it's not going to be the mean, the mean first time. It's not going to be the same. Because here, basically, you have to go from here to here, which is basically the formula here. And then what happens if you are, let's say, in the middle? You can either go back here or continue like in here. And this can produce much longer mean time. And this is important because if you think, for example, during cell division, where you have the mother and the daughter cell that start to divide, you have these narrow passages. And this we will study what happened here later on. One more remark on this formula. What is log of a big number? W if you have one million dollars on your bank account. <laughs> I'm talking to people that uh, feel that they are concerned, right? And if you take the log of it, how much you get in the end? Number of digits. What? It's the number of digits. That's right. You feel... Uh, you, don't, you feel bad, really, after the log. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does that mean for this formula? It means that the order one term can be significant because this is of order one, and this is also of order one. So, in some cases, it's important to be able to calculate the order one term. It can contribute, let's say, for 
30% of the mean uh, total time. Okay, so those are the remarks. So this. Um, yeah? Is it all so fun? Is it little O or capital? Capital O, of, yeah, sorry, capital O of 1. Is it in epsilon or in what? In epsilon. This is a, an asymptotic expansion in epsilon. And in epsilon or in 1 over epsilon? Other one. Other one means uh, constant in epsilon. This is something, this is going to be a constant here for a, for a ball. It's actually uh, log of 2 minus something, or log of 2 plus something. So this is another one term. This is a constant term that depends on the geometry. So since uh, this meeting is also about simulation, how do you simulate in an efficient manner? the arrival of a uh, Brownian <coughs> particle to a small hole. How do you do this? What is a naive way to do it? <coughs> the naive way to do it is to uh, be naive, which you take f the classical description, I mean the discretization of the Brownian motion using Euler scheme, and you move. So how long it will take? will take a long time because it is small, right? So you have to, in some sense, take your discretization step delta t such that you are not going to make a, 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 a jump that is too big, otherwise uh, you'll miss the, um, the target. So the size of delta t is constrained by epsilon. So if epsilon is very small, which is usually the case in, in, in when you simulate a chemical reaction or, or mo motion of uh, ions, brilliant motion of ions in a domain, obviously it's going to take a long time. And the bottleneck of this is exactly the small hole. That's why the formula are important, because it allows us to replace the Brownian simulation with a Poisson rate process, and the rate is the reciprocal of the mean first passage time. So the naive approach is you discretize, so you have, for example, xt plus delta t minus xt equals square root of 2d delta t with your Gaussian variable of uh, variance 1, and this is the naive approach. If you want to uh, have an adaptative step, which is what is represented here, <coughs> you should enlarge the small hole. That is, you create here a bigger small hole. Then in here, you can enlarge your delta step delta t, because now you have, let's say, something mm. that can be, uh, let's say, uh, 10 or 100 times epsilon. So you go much faster in this region, which can be a, a big chunk of your uh, space. And when you arrive here, you can jump to <coughs> the discretization with a smaller time step. And we did that several times <coughs> to, for example, to look how uh, accurate were our formula compared to Brownian simulation. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can, you, can you use instead the important sampling? Important, important sampling. So you know, in when right. you somewhere going across the fractal, and you know there there's big business. They they have techniques of how to do the Brownian motion simulations. Uh, they call it percolation time. So what, what, how do you how would you apply that here? So somewhere you sam uh, you make many paths, many Brownian paths. Yeah. And you make these smaller balls, and some way once the path after some time reaches you know this green area then you just keep those, and you make multiples of those, and you disregard those who don't reach, and so on. So they call it important sampling, and it's and you pretty would, efficient. OK, so you would win a lot in terms of timing? Yeah, yeah. OK, so maybe you can also do that. OK. <coughs> so um, 
this is more like a technical remark. I will, um, so maybe I should say that right now uh, and maybe say it again. Following this s uh, small uh, uh, lectures of three hours of, uh, of today, I will do a more complete class every Friday from 2.30 to 5 in the seminar room number 2. Right, and for the Cambridge students, I got permission to grade essays. That is, you can write something about, and I can grade you. I got permission from uh, the university. Okay, and I'll say more things maybe at, uh, at the break, during the break. So, the Green's function is by definition the, uh, in dimension 3 the solution of Lap Laplacian n equal minus delta plus 1 over the volume. And you can have here this Neumann boundary condition, and this is such that when you integrate this over the domain, integrating 1 over omega over the domain is 1, integrating the delta Dirac is minus 1, so, so this cancel out, and so that we have this compatibility condition. Now, what is the expansion of the Green's, fun of this, uh, Green's Neumann's function? Well, this is big business, <coughs> but basically for x and y um, close enough together, the term that is the most important in dimension 3 is 1 over y minus z, <coughs> 1 divided by 2 pi when one of them, actually even when two of them, but at least one of them is on the surface of the domain. And this is very important because when we calculate the mean first passage time, we use that one of the points is on the boundary. And here, if you're familiar with the classical um, Green's function, it's usually 1 over 4 pi. So here you have an additional term that comes from the image charge. That is, if you have um, a wall, you have the additional uh, image charge that contributes to this. That's why here you have 1 over 2 pi. And I, 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 I told you yesterday there is another, a, a, a new singularity that was unknown even 20 years ago, <coughs> which is proportional to the log of y minus z. This is what you have in dimension 2. And L of z and, and N of z, this is the mean curvature at the point z, and plus a regular term. So this is important because this plus the fact, so let me now give you another piece of information, and I will just uh, mention the result in dimension 3. I will not go through the detail of the calculation. So in 1873, Weber came out with the following question. It's called the electrified disk problem. It's a classic in uh, electrostatic. What is the field generated by a disk, a charged disk? What is the field and how it decays? So this you have to solve uh, Laplacian u equals 0 outside the disk. u, it is equivalent to solve u equals 0 on the disk and du dn, yeah, and, and du dn equals uh, 0 here and at infinity u goes to 1. So that uh, the solution is not 0. It turns out that when you use this, this also can be, a, uh, the interpretation can also be uh, um, equivalent for a fluid uh, moving uh, through, the, through this, um, this hole. But what is interesting, this problem can be solved. This is the solution. But what I would like to draw your attention on is the fact that the flux at z equals 0, so z equals 0, this is the plane. And when this is a disk, the flux is singular. The flux is singular. This is also the probability flux. The flux is singular means for r, r equals to a, it is infinite, and the singularity is 1 over square root, so it's an integrable singularity. But so if you think about Brownian motion, it means that when you 
the flux through the uh, this hole, the probability that you enter the probability flux is is very high. It goes to infinity at the boundary. So most of the uh, particles will enter through the uh, boundaries. And now this is important because if you want to solve the narrow escape in dimension 3, this is the flux you have to use, not a constant as we did for the dimension 2. And again, I'm not going to go through all the detail, but basically you can calculate the mean first passage time. It is proportional to the volume. A is the radius of the small, of, uh, the small hole. This is the mean curvature, and there is a term A log A. <coughs> now, what happened if, instead of having a circular hole, you have an elliptic hole? So, this is quite interesting, because now, the mean first passage time depends on the shape of the hole, and this is the elliptic function that is described here. For an ellipse of, uh, s of uh, big uh, size A and small uh, B. So, this is an important result because the shape of this absorbing part of the, of the, of the, of the absorbing uh, uh, patch is seen by the mean first passage time. All right, so if you have a molecule, if you have a binding site, you can always approximate it by a ball. But these tell us that actually we are making some mistake because the uh, mean first passage time account more of the geometry than simply the radius. And the total expansion for a general uh, um, hole actually is unknown. And actually, Okay, when we'll go for the open problem, I'll discuss uh, one of them. Okay, so now, again... Can I just check that I'm understanding correctly? Yeah. I think you said that in, in two space dimensions, when the, when the gap is just a line, you're equally likely to hit anywhere on that line. Yeah, dimension two is very different from dimension three. In space dimensions, when the gap is a circle, yes. you're more likely to hit the edge of the That's circle than right. the center. That's right. So now, let's continue on uh, some aspects of the geometry. Suppose you know the mean first passage time for one hole. <coughs> now suppose you have two holes. Who is telling me how you affect the mean first passage time when you have two holes? <coughs> so for one hole, let's say the mean first passage time is tau. Right? Now you divide this space, and we have two holes. What do you think is the mean first passage time for two holes? Naively, you would say the mean first passage time for two holes is the mean first passage time for one hole divided by two. No? Why? Oh, all right. Under which circumstance, which circumstances this can be true or not true? Okay, so here is the answer. It depends on the respective location of the two holes. <coughs> if the two holes are far apart, let's say you're in dimension two, you have two absorbing uh, windows, then the mean first passage time is actually the mean first passage time of the entire hole divided by two. But as you move the two holes, two are themselves, and suppose they merge, then the mean first passage time is the mean first passage time for, for one hole, where the size is double of the size of one hole. But since we have seen the formula just before, where the mean first passage time, you just have to, to just plug now <coughs> epsilon uh, by two epsilon, and this is of uh, log of 2 is of order 1. So this is a more or less the mean first passage time for one hole. So you go for something with a factor 2 here, with something with a factor 2 here. It's completely nonlinear. 
So basically, by moving in, in dimension two, <coughs> two holes, you can increase the mean passage time by a factor two. And this is quite important because it says that the, the respective location of, of your absorbers is, in, is make a, a difference if you calculate uh, time to absorption. All right, so again, the methods of doing this calculation is exactly following the same step. So we will do that in the small class. Is exactly following the same step, except that now we need to have a condition. We need to analyze what happened at the two holes. And what uh, uh, come into the calculation is actually the Green's function calculated at one hole and uh, um, <coughs> calculated at the second hole. So you have, you have to use the pair J of P and Q, where P and Q are the centers of the two holes. So, and again, so this is in dimension two. So we, we, you know, we did some simulation. We, you can come up with the um, analytical expression that depends on the size of each hole, epsilon and delta. And there is here a nonlinear term that depends on the distance. But of course, <coughs> since um, we have seen that the result depends also on the geometry, and the geometry is much more uh, important in dimension three. If you have hole or elliptic holes, it will affect the entire formula. So we could calculate for a small uh, disk, but not ellipses. And so again, you come out with some um, more or less the same ID in dimension two and dimension three, but it's not 50% because of the shape of the hole. Because ultimately, what is the, what is the, uh, what happened when you have a disk and you bring the other disk very close together, it's not equivalent to a disk of a radius, whatever would be the radius. Because again, the uh, Brownian particle sees the shape. OK, I'll skip all the detail. Now maybe I'll continue with some uh, um, open uh, question. The full expansion of the narrow escape time in n dimension with respect to uh, the absorbing to the total boundary is uh, still an open question. We don't know how to do it in general. How to develop a narrow escape theory for shaped object that is not simply Brownian motion, but for example, if you have a, a needle, a Brownian needle, or all kind of shape object that is sufficiently simple, so you may expect to be able to do something. And this is important if you want to simulate, for example, protein on the surface of a membrane or underneath the membrane where they have a tail and you want to look at specific uh, arrival time of a piece of the tail to uh, an important protein. And for example, in the, in the case of uh, a needle, the mean first passage time of uh, a needle to a small hole in dimension two, this is equivalent to a narrow escape time where the window is a square or, or a rectangle. Now, as you pointed out, now what happens if you have a rectangle? So we don't know how to do that. Because if a Brownian particle in dimension three and you have a rectangle, as we have seen, the, the Brownian particle sees the shape. Now, if you have a rectangle, you have singularities at the corners. So how do you? handle the singularities. This, uh, there is no flux, no Weber equivalent of what is the flux for such a shape. And actually, you can uh, show that because of the singularity, it will affect the uh, power law of the mean first passage time. Narrow escape for other processes. So we have discussed here uh, random walk. But for example, if you have jump processes, we have no idea of how to calculate uh, the narrow escape, how, for example, it depends <coughs> on delta t, on the jump. And also, in general, if um, <coughs> you think about uh, if you add a drift, this is um, the, the result will be very different depending if uh, uh, you have, for example, a non-conservative drift. 
if you have uh, b, which is, for example, a gradient of a function, or if it's not the gradient of a function. <coughs> so, and also, if you have an infinitesimal operator, it can help a lot. Like here, what was behind all of this calculation is the fact that you have Laplacian. And you have, then with Laplacian, you have Green's function. And then you can use the, the, the artillery of uh, classical analysis. But if you don't have an operator like this, how do you calculate uh, mean for spatial time? You have to go back to the description of your process. So recently we looked at this, for example, for how long it takes for a spermatozoa to find an egg in the uterus. Somebody you know, asked me one day, well, the small hole theory, what can you do with that? Can you do something useful? I said, what do you mean by useful? I said, well, why don't you look at um, you know, a small hole in the uterus and how uh, the sperm are finding the egg. We don't know really um, you know, how it works. Okay, this is a long story, but let me I could continue on and on because now you can ask what is the traject what are the trajectories of spermatozoa and how you get this information, how you model them. But what was uh, clear from the data uh, we could look at is that, for example, a spermatozoa can be well approximated with a line until it hits an obstacle where the reflection here is random. <coughs> And so suppose you have a process like this. You know, suppose you arrive here, you reflect randomly. How long it takes to find a small, this small hole? There, was, there is no uh, operator, no Laplacian, nothing that you can use. So then you have to go back, you know, into looking at the path and try to calculate something. But in general, we don't know how to do it. Okay, so for those who are Interest, I mean, if people are, uh, some, some, some of you are, are um, interested in looking at one of these uh, questions, you know, feel free to um, just buzz me. Yes? What if you have a deviation from the Markov property? What if you have a correlated random walk, for example? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, we don't know much. For example, um, for the anomalous, so there is a big industry about anomalous diffusion, you know, how you study anomalous diffusion. Uh, there is no, uh, to my knowledge, at least from the group of uh, Metzler, Klafter, there is no result about uh, a narrow escape for um, anomalous uh, diffusion. Because most of their result is in dimension one. The dimension two is already very hard. Okay, I'll skip all of this uh, um, result for many holes. Now I would like to go to diastrate. It's on purpose, there's nothing uh, written, because we're going to uh, try to guess what happened. Here, mean first passage time, so we disregard this domain. Mean first passage time in dimension two for a hole which is accessible. To on the regular part of the boundary, we said it's log of 1 over epsilon, right? So this is omega log of 1 over epsilon divided by pi d plus a term capital O of 1. Now suppose we have a hole hidden inside the cusp. So you have now a domain like this. And this is your absorbing part. How long it takes to find this part? So it took us maybe two or three years to develop the methods that I will summarize for you in two or three slides. It's not anymore a regular part of the domain. So you cannot use all the classical theory about uh, Green's function, about uh, approximating uh, your domain by having something smooth where you can use the, um, the uh, parametrization of uh, the boundary according to the length. It's not smooth. 
So it should affect the entire calculation. So what do you think? Is it longer or is it shorter to find something that is hidden in a cusp? Shorter? Who is for shorter? Okay, so everybody else is for longer. <laughs> okay, so why shorter? Because you need to find first the hole closer to the, to the, to the tunnel outside, and that hole is going to be going to be constrained to smaller volumes to find that. Yeah, but if you think about a procedure, a procedure, numerical procedure, and you reflect according to the classical <coughs> um, snail Descartes reflection, when you arrive near the curvature, basically you are going to be reflected in a direction that will be uh, outside the direction of the cusp. So it's going actually to be very hard to make your way inside. And so the result is the following. The mean first passage time, the mean first passage time in dimension two, to find something that is hidden here between two circles. So you have these circles, and this is the cusp, and you have to reach here up to the line. It's the volume here of the domain divided by square root of epsilon and r here this is the radius the, the, the radius of this uh, of this circle so it becomes one over square root so we are going from log to one over square root this is a much uh, longer time scale much longer because log we said of a big number it's of the order one and now one over square root this can be significant if you're on the on the surface and so and you are looking at, the, at this question on the surface, let's say, of the ball with the cusp. Now we are living on the surface in, dimen in dimension two. And if you have the expansion of this uh, uh, shape, which goes like with a certain power law, the mean first passage time actually depends on this uh, power law. It's one over A. A is the size, ultimately, of uh, the radius of the cusp. 1 over uh, nu divided by 1 plus nu, where the expansion of the, of the geometry near this cusp is like this. And in dimension 3, for a surface of revolution, the mean first passage time is 1 over a to the power 3 half. Not 1 over a, but 3 half. So the shape, the shape of the whole matters. And this is important if you study diffusion. If, because in, in, um, in cells, you have a lot of this bottleneck, a lot of this type of shape where you have uh, uh, narrow passages and uh, uh, <coughs> things hidden inside uh, the, um, inside the cusp. And the mean first passage time, if you want to coarse grain your simulation, you have to uh, use this type of um, uh, mean first passage time in your uh, uh, Poisson process. R is the radius of the circle. I'm sorry? Capital R. Capital R is the radius of this circle here. So it's like the curvature of, of the curve that characterizes the curve. You can also do it with two radius of curvature. The formula is a bit more complicated, but I think it's important just to get the ID of uh, what you get, how things are uh, affected. Omega is the volume, epsilon, this is here the size, the length, and here A is the um, radius of the disk here at the top. Yes? It makes the thin area longer and longer in the sense that in the limit, the whole area gets somehow like a yeah, we'll come to that. Rectangular or something. Yeah. And in the limit, I would suppose it refers to a Brownian motion on a one-dimensional interval somehow. And then exit, so this exit time then corresponds to an exit time out of an interval in 1D, right? And I think this is quadratic. In the it's, it's more complicated than this. I'll, uh, I will uh, show you what, what, what you get. Right? Uh, let me just first show the ideas of this, and then we will go 
it, it is called the connection with the neck. And then we'll discuss <coughs> what is... So here, of course, you cannot do this limit here. This limit, you cannot see anything, right? Because the geometry is fixed and epsilon goes to zero. Epsilon is a small parameter. You cannot just exchange limits with curvature. So you cannot do that here. But your point is very important, and I will show you <coughs> how it is solved. OK, so because this is a class, I think it is important to explain to you the methods. We could not, u we could not use Green's function. So you have a singularity. How do you desingularize? How you get rid of the singularity of the cusp? So it took us uh, several tries to understand this. After a few years, we came out with the idea of using uh, conformal mapping to, uh, this is called the Mobius uh, transformation, to get rid of the singularity and to shape this entire domain inside the disk. So this is normalized here to a disk of radius 1. So you can, you can renormalize everything. So that the entire shape enter into the disk with a particular geometry. So if, we d if you take this transformation, <coughs> z minus alpha divided by 1 minus alpha z, where alpha is connected to, uh, it's equal to minus 1, plus or minus because I never remember which one is the good one, square root of epsilon, I mean you, you, you have to do it and you, you see which one is the good one when you do the transformation, square root of epsilon. So now you all know that if you have to solve Laplacian u equal minus 1, now this is a classical exercise in uh, complex analysis. What is the uh, solution? What is the expression? So if you have Laplacian u equals minus 1, right? And I would like to map this entire equation inside the, the disk using the conformal mapping. So what do you have? You need to have, so you have u of z, and this is v, let's say, of uh, uh, <coughs> w, where w is a function phi of z. So how do you change Laplacian? You have to make the, um, actually, I wrote it this morning because I always make the mistake to do the, the inversion uh, incorrectly. Yeah. So when you calculate the Laplacian of this, this is Laplacian u of z, which is u of z is w of phi. So this is phi prime of z squared Laplacian of v. And this is equal to minus 1, v of w. And so what you get from this is Laplacian v equals minus 1 divided by phi prime of z, but z is phi minus 1 of w. Right? I haven't changed anything. I just changed the domain. So this is what is written here. So you calculate, you differentiate w, <coughs> nothing fancy. You write what it is equal to. And now let me show you what, how this domain is changed, it, where it is mapped to. It is mapped to a banana shape. We wrote at that time, hot dog. But banana is uh, more appropriate, I think. The small part here on the real axis stays on the real axis. The two parts here of the curvature are mapped beautifully on the disk, because what is on the disk st stay on the disk, because it is uh, the invariance of the Mobius transformation that leaves the disk invariant. The external part is mapped in the internal part, and the entire domain here is mapped in here. So here you can see this is, we have a new boundary layer. It's a new type, new kind of asymptotics. This is the boundary layer, which is bigger than the domain. Usually the boundary layer is very small and the domain is very large. 
Here, this is the opposite. This is the opposite. Uh, so this is, at that time, we uh, call it like a new type, banana type asymptotics, because this is the boundary layer, which corresponds to here. That is, if you start here, the mean first passage time will depend on the position where you start. If you start inside the big domain, everything is lost, and so you start here. And then you have to go all the way up to here to be absorbed. OK. So what have we win? A lot. Because now we have like this singular, the, the, there is no more the singularity. The problem is desingularized. And the great thing about all of this is that this size now is of the order square root epsilon. So we can approximate the two-dimensional Laplacian operator by something only in dimension one that will vary only on theta, which is the angle here. And then that if you have the Laplacian, which is just a second derivative with theta, the radius is constant, you end up with a differential equation to integrate. We have the right-hand side, which is known, and we have uh, the <coughs> second derivative of the function with respect to... Uh, to theta. We have to integrate twice, and this is exactly what we did. And you are interested in the mean first passage time when you start here at an angle, a constant square root of theta. C is the constant that you can calculate because you need to have the conservation of the flux. That is, when you integrate this equation, what do you get? If you integrate all of this in the domain or uh, in that domain, you need to have du dn, because integrate, if you integrate Laplacian, this is du dn, on the absorbing part, should be equal to minus volume. You know, this is uh, an identity. Yeah, so this is what you have to use finally here, and uh, you ended up with this uh, formula. It looks trivial, right? It took us uh, two years. This is the, um, a new type of asymptotic that we have developed in the book. And, uh, you know, we looked at it, what happened in dimension 3 with symmetry, what happened if you have a drift. Why this is important? Because now, if you think about, this is a possible application, let me remind you that the nucleus of a cell or the membrane of a cell is uh, crowded. So if you ask now, what is the model of crowding? Just place a disk. You, have, you put disk on the surface of uh, the plant. And you ask how long it takes for a Brownian particle just to escape from this fundamental domain. <coughs> and when the two disks are sufficiently closed, this is exactly the problem we have just solved. So there is a huge literature about crowding, about how you approximate crowding, how you calculate uh, mean first passage time for crowding. But so since the method that we have developed was not at that time, there was no uh, analytical results. So then what we said, said, let's try now to find what we get for this type of uh, domain. So there are different regimes, right? If the disk the radius of the disk is very small. Do you see the obstacles? The answer if the disk is very small, the particle diffuses like uh, as if the, the, the radius here tends to zero. So it's like the plan. Now there is a regime where you don't see much the cusp. And then we are back to a regime where you have a small hole in dimension two where the approximation of log is actually very good. There is no, I mean, we haven't found a, a uniform expansion we just patches the different regimes. And then the regime where the two uh, disks are very close to one another, and then we have this one over square root epsilon. Okay, so three regimes. And then we, uh, you could use this uh, uh, formula to connect this <laughs> with the what is now the diffusion coefficient. I mean, how do you, what is the meaning of, of First of all, okay, under a microscope, what do you see? You don't see the obstacles. You see jump 
of your trajectories, and then you have algorithm to connect the dots. So if you, are, if you look at your process at a very uh, short time scale, what do you see? You see Brownian motion with a diffusion coefficient, which is the diffusion coefficient of your particle. But if you look now at a different time scale, which is a time scale at which the particle has a time to hop in between those fundamental domains, then you see the influence of the obstacles. This is a second time scale. And in between, you have to, um, you know, this is, this is an example of, um, you can imagine that one slope here, this is a mean square displacement. One slope is for the, diffu the, the, the real diffusion, and the second is the effective diffusion. So there is a regime where you have to switch between this curve and that curve, where you can see some kind of anomalous behavior. Because this is, you are in a specific regime. But if you are in a regime where delta t is, is large enough, you'll see the effective diffusion coefficient, which can be calculated. So now, this is the way to coarse grain your process as a jump process between the neighboring uh, uh, square here. One, two, three, and four. Or this is equivalent to have a diffusion equation <coughs> with a diffusion coefficient which is one over twice the mean first passage time. Why twice? Because when you arrive here, there's a probability to come back. And it's not the mean first pass this is not the transition. To make a transition, you have to make sure that you fall into the second one. L is the distance here <coughs> between the two, <coughs> and uh, you have uh, this um, divided by four. And now we use this. At that time, we had different uh, uh, information about the diffusion coefficient of um, a membrane when you remove the cholesterol, which, where you could switch from 0 0.04 micrometer square per second to 0 0.2. And by using this calculation of the ratio, you see you have a nonlinear here behavior of the ratio of the diffusion coefficient because of the square root. I mean, this is this um, function calculated with this formula and plotted here. So this is nonlinear when the two holes when they touch, nothing can go through. That's why here you arrive to zero. And we come out with the number that 70% of the membrane should be occupied by obstacles. Now you can argue, well, this is a model. You took it everything on the, on the grid. You know, this is a square lattice. Why not using other kind of um, organization? And you're perfectly correct. In crystal, you have all the different type of organization that leads to different uh, structure. You know, it can even lead to um, a, ten a diffusion tensor, not having only uh, a simple um, uh, diffu uh, diffusion equation. OK. Excuse me. Yes. You just, you know, before you said it really depends very strongly how the obstacles are some way spaced in space. So, you know, in that case, the 70%, maybe just 35% or, or twice. That's true. Is it true? You yeah. Know, because it really depends on the location. Yeah. So, we wanted to have here an order of magnitude, an ID. But it's certainly not 10% or 20%. It's, yeah, 70% more or less, maybe 10 or 20%. We didn't look into the error. But, but can you make an estimate when you would say that if 70% are occupied, that you have some you know, lower bound or upper bound? Is it possible I mean, to get results of that type? So how would, uh, okay, how to do this? Okay, so you can think about having, for example, disk of different sizes, of a random size, and you, 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 you describe this with, with a law that you are giving in the system. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting. I haven't done it. I think nobody did it. But you see, it's important to have a regular pattern because if you throw things randomly, you end up having cavities. And if you have cavities, then and if you have many cavities, then you end up having a small hole problem, the time it takes to escape from a small hole, which can affect a lot the entire diffusion uh, uh, coefficient. And these cavities may be at with, with a, a, a spatial uh, dimension that is different from the size of these obstacles. So the way you are 
you are looking at your question, the restriction you are, you are imposing to yourself about the distribution of the obstacle might be very important. But this is, um, yeah, this is an interesting question. Sure. The short answer we haven't done, and if you want to try, uh, <coughs> I think it's interesting. Okay, I will skip this. We, okay, I'll skip this, and I, I would like to finish <coughs> with what you suggested. Somebody suggested about the neck. Now let's discuss escape with the neck. So we'll see, we'll connect. This is a non-smooth connection. We can also connect smoothly. Now I'm going to open, uh, we have to bet now. It's, it's good that when money is involved, you know, you think twice about your answer. Mm -hmm. Next time I bring chocolate. It's easier with chocolate. Okay, now here comes the question. What is the mean first passage time? How long it takes to escape from a domain with a neck? So if the neck here is zero in dimension two, the answer is here. Volume divided by pi d log of one over epsilon. We just did it. Now we add a neck. What do you think? <coughs> Okay, let me help. You can say this. The mean first passage time <coughs> for a Brownian particle is the time it takes to escape to reach here plus the time it takes to reach here. Am I good? Am I good or right? Or wrong? Wrong. Who say yeah? Who wants to Is it okay to say that? No. Yes. No no? Who say yes? Yeah, okay, let's motivate. Why? Yes. You have to get to the neck first, and then you get to the bottom of the neck. Yeah, it's your neck? Yeah. Okay. You All right? Back, right? Back. Yeah, but that's correct. Now, now, if you are here, there is a probability that you move up to here. And like when I drive, you know, with my wife sitting next to me, she said, no, I forgot something. <laughs> you know, I have to go, you have to go back. <laughs> and it happens. You go here, and you, you, you take whatever you have, and you continue. And again, no, we have to go by, uh, and so you can continue an infinite number of times. <laughs> it's important to choose, uh, you know, your partner uh, to make sure about your choice. That's why it, it takes so long, you know. Okay, so indeed, so now let's think about it. You start here, you start moving, now you're in, in a cylinder. You go back, you reach this point, with a certain probability you are going to Go, you are going to escape the boundary layer, and when you escape the boundary layer, how long it takes to escape again? How long it takes to escape when you are inside, at any point outside the boundary layer? This is exactly this, because it doesn't, st it doesn't matter when no, where is the point where you started, because you are outside the boundary layer, so all the points here are equivalent. So you are lost again, and you are again to start afresh, like a renewal mean first passage time, starting from here. So the mean first passage time is not going to be simply the sum of the two, but account for multiple infinite uh, uh, narrow escape time here with some probability that we need to calculate. Actually, when I started first, you know, we started first this question, I asked uh, my student just to do the simulation, he said, the formula doesn't work. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's much longer than, than anything related or close to this mean first passage time because of the neck. And then we had to uh, pay attention and, and look at the problem carefully. He saw that there was this multiple uh, trajectory that, that they were real, and they were contributing. Not that they were just existing, but <coughs> didn't care. They were contributing to the mean first passage time. Now, why we were motivated? Yeah. So, but just intuitively, I mean, if you would have a ball with the same volume of the ball and the neck, which, because then also you have a bigger volume from which you first have to get to the little hole. But here we are always we are always in the situation where the radius of the neck is small. This okay, is this so is this is uh, otherwise, if you don't have the small parameter, you, you cannot even start the analysis. Yeah, I thought like maybe for example, yeah. Yeah, exactly, because if the neck is quite, like in the picture, it was quite broad. 
then I guess if you would compare it to just the sphere with the same volume, I mean, then it, the snake has a volume on it. Yeah, the fact that we have a small radius is important. Now, why we were motivated, I mean, you have to be a bit um, vicious to start to put a neck where there is no need of a neck, right? But it, it didn't come from, from the sky. I mean, we had, we, it came from a, a real question. This is down to spine, so let me st state it ag again, because I think it's very important. How many neurons do we have in our brain? About 10 to the power 11. How many synapses we have? I mean, the neuron have, turn neuron, how many synapses do you have? About 1,000. Plus, you multiply by the number of, uh, you know, mammalians and species that are living on Earth. <laughs> and so, on, on a single neuron, you can have up to hundreds of thousands of this structure. Hundreds of thousands. Not all neurons. In spiny neurons. So, we have here a structure that is uh, extremely abundant. And again, we don't know much about um, why the connection between two neurons occur in this structure. However, you can see here a spine under a glutamate condition where you have a neck here and it connects the head. And you can see here increasing when you put uh, a, a glutamate and decreasing when you remove and you put a large concentration of glutamate. I have to tell you a story. So when this paper uh, was ready, my partner decided to call this the um, dynamic of an erected spine. <laughs> so I said, why you choose this title? So it's going to be provocative. I said, sure. So they submit it to the journal. And then we got an email from the editor. <laughs> said, I like your work, but you have to change the title. So we did. We had another uh, a paper like this. It was in 2004. It was about the mean first passage time with a killing. So we named the paper Survival of uh, a, a, a Trajectory and their Killing. So it was again, at the same time, there was the Gulf War. It was for Pierre. We got a special email from the editor. Please change the title if you want the paper to be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this provocation is to say that things can change dynamically and it's important to see how it affects diffusion. And actually this is what uh, my biologist uh, partner did. They look at diffusion in the structure. This is a time scale. So you see it's well approximated. So you are looking here at calcium entering here through the structure and they are measuring calcium, how it decays in the structure. So this is diffusion. I think they, they use even a dye here, a special dye to, to start also looking at this. So you see 100, 100 something, now it's, it shrinks, now you see that's how it has been uh, uh, shrinked here, and then it, when it goes back, you can see how things, it doesn't go back to the same point because it may have changed, but it affects diffusion. So what is now the, the exponential rate that you would like to fit here? If we agree about this narrow escape and it is small, then the process should be exponentially distributed. It should be Poissonian. And what should be the rate? It should be 1 over the reciprocal of the mean first passage time. So now we are left with calculating the uh, mean first passage time. Sorry, what are you plotting on this graph? I'm plotting time versus uh, numbers, concentration in here in the head. In the whole, in the head, in the whole yeah, head. I think. Oh well, I think everywhere. But you see, it's usually the, the in in the tube. The, there was small amount. So yeah, I think it's uh, everywhere. Well, so the blue actually no, it's not correct. The blue I think is in the head, and then th they looked at the different <coughs> colors. I think they took different uh, patches here to look at uh, the um, <coughs> along along the uh, spine how things were changing in time. So the calcium starts in the head and it gets out. That's right. Okay, so, um, okay, I would like to, uh, okay, I'll one more piece of information for this question, I'll give the result and then I would like to move on 
So how long do I have now? I'm sorry? Like, like 15 minutes? 10.30 is the first break. 10.30 is the first break. Yeah. The first break, which means two lectures. Yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I would like to go fast on this, but I think it is important because it's a very interesting re relation. How do we calculate the mean first passage time in the case where we can distinguish two separate structure? The mean first passage time from a point here to the entire domain would be the mean first passage time to the intermediate domain, let's say the head. And this would be plus the mean first passage time when you start exactly at this called this uh, uh, separatrix, this abstract separatrix between the two, to the neck. And actually, the time is just adding times. But this formula is a bit uh, tricky because it accounts for all the return when you start here. However, this is good because the time from here to here, this is the mean first passage time. So if you have everything inside the, uh, the domain with a small absorbing patch, we are going to use here the mean first passage time formula. And this will account for the multiple um, return of the particle to the head. I'm not going to prove this. This is shown in the book. And to make a long story short, if you have, so to answer the question that uh, you ask, if you have a domain, you have a neck of length L, it can be a, you can approximate it as a line in two dimension, <coughs> or it can be a circle in uh, three dimension, or it can be a disk if you are inside the three dimension domain. So I'm not going to go through the entire calculation. It is basically using the same Green's function and uh, here using the continuity of the solution of the Laplacian, because you have to solve the Laplacian equation that you have to break. So it's like in quantum uh, uh, theory, you have continuity of the function, and here you have to use also the matching the continuity of the flux. And from this, what you get is this very interesting formula. Let, let me go slowly through the formula. The time to escape is the time to escape through the neck. L squared divided by 2D, so this is omega 1, I think this is entire vol this is the volume of the uh, head, I think, divided by the omega a, the omega a is the radius here. So it's uh, either uh, pi a squared in dimension 3, or it's proportional to a in dimension uh, uh, 1, multiplied by L divided by D. So if OK, l let's go now to the, um, <coughs> to the results. Let's look at the dimension 2. That this, this is that just the, what you see on the figure. The first term here, this is the length. This is the mean first passage time to escape just from the uh, neck. This is the mean first passage time to escape from the head. But this is due to the return, to the renewal process. It comes back again and again. And what is interesting, it's not anymore log of 1 over a. It becomes 1 over a because of the infinite possibility of returning. So suddenly, the mean first passage time becomes much longer. And of course, uh, if L equals 0, this drops and this drops, you get back to the classical mean first passage time. And so you see that when L is sufficiently uh, large compared to A, you see this, uh, this is significant. Again, if you are, if you, this is for the non-smooth connection with the mean first passage time that we calculated here. If we use the diastrate time when you have a cusp, so this is called the smooth connection, instead of having here the log, you get 1 over A. And still, the dominant term is L divided by A. Now here there is a moral, there's a, an interesting uh, understanding here that the leading order term does not depend on the connection. You can connect smoothly or you can connect, you know, with a discontinuous manner. The leading order term of the mean first passage time depends on the volume, the length of uh, the tube and A is the radius here. 
right? So this was a very surprise when we come to this result. We had to check it a uh, hundred times because we saw that the connection would matter. It doesn't at the leading order. It doesn't. And actually, so in the science paper published more than uh, about 20 years ago, they use actually the, the leading order term in dimension three to analyze their FRAP experiments. So indeed, this, this, is, this is true. I don't know how they came out, uh, uh, they cooked th this term. It's not clear to us how they come out to this conclusion. It's really a mystery, but they did it right. Dimensional analysis. Yeah, but if you do dimension analysis again, when the whole, when the neck is small, then you see the, the other one term. But if the neck of the spine are, are long enough, you do not. You know, <laughs> I have to tell you another uh, story. I received uh, an email from a guy from Stanford. A student wanted to go there. So I write a letter of recommendation. And I received, in the last question of the email, the last question was the following. Is the participant, does he have luck? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Stanford. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, Stanford. Luck. Yeah, I think uh, we should uh, remember this. <laughs> this is how I get this uh, understanding of this result, that they got it right. <laughs> they had luck. Was that the business school at Stanford, or was it a different department? <laughs> Is that what? Was it the business school at Stanford? No, Is no, <laughs> you don't want to know what school it was. <laughs> Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, luck is something, I mean, it's not part of these uh, lectures, <laughs> but we should think about it because we're talking about uh, stochastic processes. <coughs> luck is, uh, yeah, maybe something important. But yeah, so that's the result. It's independent at first order and it works. And then this is important. And now in this, this paper was not about diffusion, it was about electricity. And now you can ask another question, and I'm not sure I would have time. It's how you connect diffusion with electricity, with Poisson and Planck, because they use this, this time, to say that this is related to the resistance of the neck. Now, what is the resistance? What is the meaning of, a, you know, you know what is the resistance of, a, of uh, an electrical device? You know, you have electron moving in the copper and has been studied. It is well less understood what is uh, uh, the resistance of, of the neck. And actually, they said that the resistance of the neck is proportional to 1 over this mean first passage time. But this is certainly um, not the right way of, uh, of thinking. Because how come you can have a resistance of a structure, which is just the neck, that should depend on the volume of the head? Cannot be. Because the resistance has to be intrinsic to the structure you are um, looking at. So to that day, electricity, which is electrodiffusion, diffusion present an, elect an electrical field that is generated by the motion of iron. It's an open question. If you are interested, I think last year we have uh, an opinion in Nature Review uh, Neuroscience on this. We discuss um, what it can do and what it cannot do. And I think, um, we still do not understand much about electricity in those small devices. And why it's important now? <laughs> because there are new dyes, new voltage dyes, that's where people can look under the microscope about the changes in the voltage. This was not possible a couple of years ago. OK, let me now uh, skip. We're going to move on to a different uh, uh, lecture, which is supposed to be lecture number two. Uh, I want, <coughs> yeah, maybe I'll say what I want to say on this. This is about a stochastic chemical reaction. And I would like to, um, to present an analytical aspect. So we have seen with Sam and uh, Dave really numerical aspect, how you calculate, how you do um, calculation with this. Now I would like to look at analytical results. Why this is not moving?
Okay. <coughs> Another means for passage time. <coughs> so we're interested in modeling chemical reaction and getting results about how things depend on the different parameters. Analytically or asymptotically. So part two, mean first passage time to threshold. Some reading that, that's, that's coming from us, you know, uh, uh, there was not much competition, I would say, on this, about this analytical part. So we started in 2005 with shoes, and then we developed what is called the mean, th the, the, the mean time to threshold, which is how long do you have to wait when you have, let's say, you start with chemical, let's say, A and B, to form a fixed number of AB molecules, let's say, let's say 20 or 5 or whatever. You have a threshold. How long do you have to wait for this to happen? Can you calculate this with respect to uh, the different uh, rates and how you do it? And this is important because, again, it was the idea of going th from molecular event into a cellular event. How you transform molecular, uh, um, active molecular dynamics into something that says that the cell has to do something. And if I have time, I'm not sure I will, there was two applications. One is uh, for the separation of the spindle uh, pole body when the two chromosomes are uh, teeth apart. And there was another application with Kevin Burridge about what's the probability for a messenger RNA to escape the nucleus where you can have um, microRNA that can come. And if there is enough of them, it is uh, degraded. Could be also mean time of extension. Could be also mean time of extension, sure. Okay, so I have 15 minutes, so I will motivate this, give some motivation, and then we will go to the uh, theory. So let me remind you, so this is again, I'm advertising for the third, um, third workshop. Yeah, that's going to be about, uh, so my uh, student who became now uh, an assistant professor in Paris, we looked at uh, photoreceptors and um, the response. So this is an eye, you have the light. This is here a layer of uh, the retina. You have here this uh, very beautiful, beautiful alignment of cones and rods. Cones is, are able to detect many photons during light and rods are responsible for night vision. And so if you uh, magnify or if you do a representation of a rod, it's a collection of discs. And if you record from one of these, you see those bumps. And those bumps are the response to a photon. And those are averages. When you average, so you, when you look at data, you have to make sure about what you're looking at. This is the noise. Nothing happened. And so, so sometimes you send a photon, you record, and there is nothing. And sometimes you see this bump and you average, so that's why it's very smooth and very beautiful here. And so the question is, uh, what uh, generates those bumps? What is the process, what's the amplification process? So actually, you are interested in a chemical reaction where you start by one photon that hit a certain molecule, <coughs> it's called the rhodopsin. The rhodopsin will move by Brownian motion on the surface, and each time it will hit a specific uh, uh, G-couple um, protein, there's a reaction going on from GDP, uh, to G to from GDP to GTP, and then this molecule has become activated. So you go from this uh, uh, activated rhodopsin, what is called a transducin, and it becomes an activated transducin, and then transducin activated a molecule called, called phosphodiesterase, which is PDE, not partial differential equation, but, but phosphodiesterase. It becomes activated, and it also can be de de deactivated. But this ensemble of chemical reaction say that you have you know, a certain number of, of molecules that, that are going to be responsible to kill some specific molecule that's called cyclic GMP. And when the cyclic GMP molecules are not at the channel, the channels are closing. So this is the entire process. Now you want to model it. You want to ask, for example, how many PDs are going to be activated? And this occurs in a single compartment. So if something occurs in a single compartment, how can you see something 
when you have 1,000 of compartments, basically if you change one out of 1,000 of uh, the system, and if the cell is able to, let's say, look at the entire ensemble, one out of 1,000 is negligible. So you will not see a photon. Actually, there is a coupling because when things are disappearing here, molecules that come from the neighboring uh, compartments are also hydrolyzed. And that's why you get uh, 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 things propagate by diffusion, by depletion. You deplete at some point, and everything that comes here is depleted. So you extend your uh, process, and this is the second part of amplification. So this is, again, a sort of uh, uh, motivation of uh, the question how you model this uh, G-couple uh, uh, signal that you go from one activated molecule to several on the surface. So this is more than actually the amount of change. So again, I'm not going to show that today. But uh, in the workshop number uh, three, I think uh, we'll have uh, two or three lectures on this. We can use the Gillespie algorithm to simulate this chemical reaction. And then you have to couple this uh, to study the uh, time-dependent uh, time dependent, uh, PDE, uh, phosphodiesterase activation. And then you have to calculate, to compute the hydrolysis of cyclic GMP that occur in this compartment. And you have to use some diffusion equation and you use some homogenization <coughs> theory to reduce this 3D to a 1D line. So you have to couple this with this um, uh, reaction uh, diffusion that occur on, on one uh, compartment. And then also I didn't discuss, but you have to model the noise and what is the noise of uh, the um, inside the structure. And so I would like to give you the, the, the an important result of, of this, of what you can find in biology. That when there is no photon, nothing entering the rod um, outer segment, the number of activated phosphodiesters that is a molecule that maintains the concentration of cyclic GMP is about one. Now, again, I think 15 years ago this came as, uh, as, as a big surprise. That in such compartments, the regulation of the chemistry that will define the noise, and again, what is the noise here? So here, yesterday, we heard about channel noise. Channel noise is the fact that the channel can flicker, can open, close, open, close, open, close. The time scale of this noise is uh, 100 hertz, 300 hertz, in, if you look at uh, the um, power spectrum. However, there is another noise called the dark noise that has been observed. This is this fluctuation here that you see. Of, uh, and this is not accounted by the channels. This is, I mean, by the flickering of the channel. This is due to a process that has to do with diffusion where the, um, when you don't have this important molecule that disappear, you have a local increase in the concentration of the molecule here that regulate the channel. And by random, so it appears and disappears by chance. It's a Poisson process. Sometimes two can appear. And, and when there is nothing, you can have a local increase. And so this creates fluctuations that changes the number of molecules in this compartment that will affect then the binding, the probability to bind the channel. So more channel will be bound, less channel will be bound. And this is of the order of about 30 hertz, the noise, the power spectrum of the noise for this. Not 100, 30. And this is called the dark noise. And for many years it was unknown what was the reason for this. So it has to do with the flickering of a single molecule in this compartment. So this is remarkable that, that such a system which allows us to see single photons are so regulated, so well regulated. They work with few numbers of molecules. And that's why here you need a stochastic chemical reaction to account for all of this. Another thing we found out, and this is the result of really 10 years of work, this molecule is called the phosphodiesterase. We could calculate how long it takes, this is a mean first passage time problem, how long it takes for a particle to find here this uh, um, absorbing patch. 
And here again, what was very um, surprising is that you are in a cylinder and you could not approximate it as 2D and it's not 3D. You are in between 2D and 3D. Now remember, mean first passage time in 2D is log. Log of 1 over epsilon. Mean first passage time in 3D is 1 over epsilon. And here is exactly what you get. You get a combination of the two, 1 over A and log of 1 over A. This is the rate if you have an absorbing patch at which the particle arrives by diffusion to this small hole. Now this, this so what uh, uh, we found uh, using modeling simulation anal and data analysis is that the rate at which this molecule hydrolyzes the cyclic GMP is not the same it, if it has been activated through the light pathway or if it is spontaneously activated. Let me repeat. If this molecule is activated because of the entire pathway, it has a certain rate of hydrolysis, which actually um, can be calculated from um, electrophysiological data. And if it is spontaneously activated, that is activated because by random, by chance, the rate at which it, it, it does its job is not the same. Now again, this came up as a surprise, and again, all of this is uh, summarized in this uh, literature that started uh, more than 10 years ago. And again, there will be a special lecture about how you do all of this um, slowly, and how you simulate the noise. <coughs> you see, this is the noise, this is what happens when you put the wrong noise, and this is what happens when you put the correct noise. You see that, uh, you know, the property of the noise are very different. And here, you have to average many realizations to be able to see the, the, um, the photon. But we don't average. The rod are not doing any average. You have to see uh, what you see, you know? And very quickly, otherwise, uh, you know, if you are in a wild environment, uh, you are eaten alive. So our idea of studying things by doing mean and expectation and an average, this is not what the uh, cell is doing. So yet, Understanding how it is, how what's, how you characterize the system by doing averaging. This is the uh, readout. This is the um, what you can get, what you can read from the system. You cannot get just get a single trajectory. So, to open the box, I think is the important point to understand how you simulate the, the, the chemical reaction, how you do it uh, correctly, how you get this information, and ultimately, how you can use all of this to predict chemical reaction in vivo, without killing the cell, <coughs> in vivo. I think this is um, a new trend now, how you use really modeling to extract such information <coughs> without breaking the cell. Because otherwise you, you will not see this. Okay, so I have five minutes to start and end, the meantime to threshold. And then I want to move on in the next class about uh, how you use all of these to analyze super-resolution data. So this is, um, you have receptors that are fixed, let's say you have a certain number of them, and you have a molecule that is moving by diffusion. We are interested in the first time that a certain number of them are bound. So of course they can bind and unbind. You can also say that the unbinding is zero. And so the question is how the mean first passage time depends on the threshold, T. And as you will see, it's not linear. And I would like to show you how you calculate this. OK? So how you start all of this? So let me skip. Uh, how you start the story? You start the story again using the small hole theory for coarse graining. Because if the, now we have, OK, let's back up. We have now, in the previous uh, uh, lecture, we have understood what happens if you have many holes. If the holes are coming together or if they are well separated, we can have, we can calculate separately the mean first passage time. And this is exactly the rate constant. This is the time it takes <coughs> to arrive to one of these uh, holes. So now you can coarse grain the entire reaction diffusion because it's small, the rate of arrival is Poissonian, by a Markov chain. 
And now we can ask what happened between time t and t plus delta t. Suppose, so between time t and t plus delta t, only one event can happen. Either you have already k bound sites, and one of them unbinds. So you have, let's say, k plus 1, and you unbind with the rate k minus 1. That depends only on the local properties. This is this term here. Or you, you, we had k minus 1 bound site, and one event happened, which is one particle arriving to one free binding site. All right, between t and t plus delta t, this is the only two events that can happen. The probability that two happen is uh, order of delta t squared, so we can neglect them. Or nothing happened. Those are the three possibilities. <coughs> so you can write, so Dave Anderson did uh, quite a lot of this uh, you know, during his lecture, so I'm not going to uh, do it by hand, but you can, ca you can write p of having k molecule at time t plus delta t equals probability of having k molecule at time t plus the three events that I've just described, which are described here. So you have k plus 1 binding site and, and one, the, 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 the probability that one of them uh, disappeared is proportional to k plus 1. Or we had k um, minus 1 bound. So what is the rate of arrival if you have k? It means that the number of free molecules are m0 minus k because k already bound. How many free sites you have if you have s0 sites? And if you have already k that are bound, it remains S0 minus k. Am I going too fast? Oh, it's OK. So the end of the story is that you write here this um, Markov chain. You have the first, of course, the first one is uh, different because uh, you, don't, um, you don't unbind, right? If you have uh, 0, you cannot unbind. And the last one is also different because when everything is uh, full, uh, you know, you cannot have one more. And here you have to be careful whether you have more of S0 compared to M0. So I'm not going to enter into this detail, but basically you have your Markov chains. Now can you study it? Can you solve it? What can you get? So there is one more thing that I have to tell you. How do you now include in this ensemble of equation the time to threshold, the time that at, at capital T, that's it, you are done. This is not contained in this, um, in this dynamics. It's like putting a, a boundary condition where you study a stochastic process. It's not contained in the dynamics. This is what you want. So you have to impose something here. So what you, are, what you, what you have to impose is that a state, capital T, is going to be the absorbing state. The state that when you reach here, you cannot go back. And this is exactly what you are doing here. You write the same ensemble of equation until t minus 1. And then, I mean t minus 2. And you have a specific equation for t minus 1 because you cannot start from the state t. t is absorbing. And then you arrive to state t only when uh, you have k minus 1, t minus 1 bound, and 1 arrive. And that's it. And then you have to normalize everything from 0 to t, not to uh, any kind of um, total number. And now what is the mean first passage time to threshold? The probability that your system still exists between time t is exactly pt. And so the mean first passage time to threshold turns out to be just simply the integral from 0 to infinity of this uh, pt. Well, I mean, one, 1 minus uh, this pt, which you have to calculate from here. So if you start with 0, with p0, you have to solve the entire um, Markov chain, and then you can calculate your mean first passage time to threshold, which is the formulation of this. And now we want to go one step further. We want to solve it. We want to get the dependency with respect to the different parameters. <coughs> so it turned out that the mean first passage time, which is integration from 0 to infinity of this, 
you can come up with a system of equation for the AK, which is <coughs> you have to integrate from zero to infinity of the um, system of equation we just discussed. Just integrate from zero to infinity this system, and this will give this will give us if we can calculate all the AK from zero to t minus one, the initial passage time, and this lead actually to the linear uh, equation to be solved. So you have a matrix equation in the AK that needs to be solved. And for example, in the case when you don't have um, an unbinding rate, this is just the sum of the arrival uh, rate um, to the remaining uh, binding site up to T. And with this, it's clear that you can do any kind of asymptotics. So in some sense, this is a problem of last passage time. You have to wait for the t last, the T1, to arrive. It's the, it's the last of the mean passage time. Right? You have to wait that you have T particle, t particle that arrives to the right place. So you can then use this, and this is trivial, you know, you have this calculation, and you can go to different limits. So I'm sorry, the box means um, lower, much lower than S0. So depending of the M0 particle are much lower than S0, S0 much lower than M0, you can go to different limits. So this is, you know, at this point, this becomes um, an exercise. But what you can get also is what happens when you have also unbinding. And this becomes much more interesting because then you can uh, look at uh, an exact uh, expression and you have to calculate this uh, quantity here. That depends, of course, on the forward binding rate, which is your mean first passage time calculated previously, the unbinding rate, and plus the term, and you can do again <coughs> all kind of asymptotics. And, and from here, you see that uh, there is a non linear dependency of the mean first passage time with respect to the threshold. And again, this is important because if you have in your cell to be activated, you need uh, five uh, protein or, or ten. It's not the same of having five or ten because you have this nonlinear effect, and this might be important for the property at the cellular level, which are here derived from property at uh, the molecular level. I think uh, you must be cooked now. I'll stop. I'll stop all of this. I, I had, you know, much more. I'll stop now and we'll resume. I'll try. I have two lectures to do in one lecture, but I will do only one. I would like to show you, I think it's uh, important, how we use all of this material from, statist so from uh, statistical physics and stochastic processes to extract data from super resolution microscopy and how you simulate in the image, in the confocal image, with a resolution of the super resolution and how you find grid in between to do this. I think it's, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see that. All right, so we have now a <coughs> half an hour break, I think. Okay, we'll resume in half an hour, let's say at 11.